Hello, hello. Sometimes we get treated like a nobody. Y'all are still here. The faithful. You get a car. You get a car. You get a car. All right. Um, wow. Impressive, Ray. This um as you all know, um David Makes Man is the follow-up to the Oscar-winning film Moonlight from the co-writer Terrell Alvin McCraney. And you can see the aesthetic similarities, the magical realism and the like. As you know, the series is a deeply personal story inspired by events in his own life growing up in the projects of South Florida and that same Miami or South Florida landscape uh, in Moonlight that you can see uh, persistent here. The series is also executive produced by Michael B. Jordan and Miss Oprah Winfrey and D. Harris Lawrence. So you know it's going to be uh, a series that you don't want to miss and just showing you this first uh, episode uh, is a teaser. So why don't you please join me in welcoming the showrunner and executive producer Miss D. Harris Lawrence. She here. She's coming. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I got to tell you, uh, given the the death of the great Toni Morrison, right? I'm I'm thinking mm -hmm. Song of Solomon, mm -hmm. Milkman Dead. Mm -hmm magical realism mm -hmm. and the ability of black men to fly and to reimagine their future. And here you are, you know, with this uh, tremendous project situating black masculinity at the intersection of magic and misery. Mm -hmm. And so for this black prodigy, you know, to tell that story of a haunted young man haunted by a haint, a saint, a, a presence, right? It's just, it, it, Morrison is all on my mind, but of course, Moonlight, it already touched that terrain, but this one branches out in a new and uh, very interesting uh, dimension. Tell us why it's important to bring a story like that to the big screen. I was excited when I saw it and then seeing it again here tonight. Um, I think, well, yeah. um, I think for Terrell, um, as far as this story, um, and he is very big in trilogies, if you've seen Moonlight. I think it was the intersection of when you turn the age of 13, when you can go one way or the other. And it was very important for him to like figure out because he realized it was at that time when he was 13 that he had to make those choices. And he had to make those choices kind of alone in a way. And it's, it, what does that mean when it comes to, you know, when you don't have your mentor um, as in the character of Sky, or someone that's not totally guiding you, but you are also looked at as a young child, but also looked at as someone that um, the mother is also holding on to. To you know, we have a deal. You have you you keep your end of the bargain. I'll keep my end of the bargain. Um, what that does to a young man as you're going, you know, through the world. Uh, when I first met Terrell, uh, I told him I could relate to it because I felt like I was a female David. When you're being bussed and when you have to code switch and when you're like going to another school that's majority, you know, white who don't look all the way like you and you have to like have all these different rules. I thought it was interesting. Um, I was here for uh, the last one for Just Mercy when he said you get to the point now where you realize I'm exhausted. I've been code switching for a while now and it's exhausting. Right. No, yeah. <laughs> we have the mic switch. Um, <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. So speaking of that, right, we talked in, 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 the, in the earlier one in Just Mercy and then even with, with Greenleaf about the complexity of black life. Mm -hmm. You know, and when I watch something like this, 
it just reminds me of how we're just pummeled with stereotypes. Mm. We're just pelted with the same old thing. And so in order to do that, A, you got to tell a different story, or B, you got to tell the same story differently. Mm -hmm. And it seems like this story, you know, as in Moonlight, right, with a mother, you know, who then puts upon her child, or at least he assumes responsibilities mm -hmm. that are far beyond his age, and yet he's a prodigy, so he's intellectually developed in one sense, but freighted with this kind of emotional uh, trauma. Mm -hmm. And and so many black lives, so many young black lives are, are subject to that. And that might be police brutality, it mm -hmm. could be the teacher not paying attention to their development in school, mm -hmm. or kicking them out early, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, it seems to me that by telling this particular story, it's not just the story of this young man. You're really conjuring a black childhood that is disappearing before our very eyes that's not allowed to breathe, not mm -hmm. allowed to grieve, not allowed to grow because it's either prematurely cut down or it's prematurely given so much responsibility that, that they can develop. Exactly. And therein lies the PTSD of it all mm -hmm. or the childhood trauma that you have to like carry with you. Mm -hmm. um, also, it has been amazing to me and how, you know, we've had these, you know, uh, police, you know, shootings right. of young people. And with we realize that they're not seeing our children as children. Right. Um, when you have a 14 year old, you know, being shot, think they're an adult. So in this and showing David makes man, I mean, this, you know, 14 year old young boy. Um, who is being bust, who is having, you know, allies within his community, you know, um, who is uh, writing that, you know, that, you know, um, line, as he said, between the Ville and them. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to see that he is just like everyone else. We've taken this to a lot of film festivals that, um, and we had a great reception. Um, and everyone sees something in this show that they speak to, whether they're you know black or not, and that's amazing because mm -hmm. there's universality in this young man, you know young man's journey. That's right. That's um, right. So that has been what's really been great that what we did in, in showing his journey and through his POV that has touched a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And we were talking earlier about Coltrane and Miles, but we got. <laughs> Ella Fitzgerald, you know, Sarah Vaughn, the great Felicia Rashad. Yes. You know, just, I mean, seeing her is like being blown away just by her presence. Yes. Right. Um, speak to us about the importance of her presence uh, in this project and what it signifies in terms of a continuity between an earlier generation of black actors and the new ones that are coming on the scene. Oh, my God. What do you say about Felicia Rashad? She is so giving, but at the same time, listens. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the way she was with these young people, mm -hmm. um, playing Dr. Woodstrap, which, who is a very complex um, um, teacher. She is about, you know, teaching these kids, you know, you know, as far as where they come from, right. you know, who they are, but at the same time, you know, as you'll see down the line, she also shows some other, you know, complexity, complexities to her mm -hmm. because of she also, um, if I say too much, anyway, right. <laughs> there are like, you know, certain things that she does that you realize, oh, okay, there is a line that gets crossed with her in certain ways. Mm -hmm. But she is about teaching without, um, you know, holding your hand. So mm -hmm. that's a different type of teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So, and she just did it with such um, dignity and such... Um, Man, it's like I can't, I can't imagine not having Dr. Wistrap, you know, be right. Felicia Rashad. They're one and the same. Right. Um, and showing, and she uses the word a lot when you watch the show, being human, not being black, white, you know, Latino, everything else. It's about being human and what right. that means when you grow up in the situation. Right. You know, so. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting when they have all these studies and black folk can't open movies overseas, all that, you know, madness, mm -hmm. right, that Black Panther killed and some others. Um, what's interesting, however, is that, you know, black folk can go to movies, ain't got no black people on the screen. <laughs> we, girl, move, no, right. move, stop. We're mm -hmm. talking, we're, we're mm -hmm. reflecting, we're crying, we're empathizing. Yes. Because you ain't got to be us for us to understand we could be you in that situation. Exactly. And what is it about, I mean, it, do you think there's progress being made? And, and when you say that even non, 
you know, African American right. or non-black people see mm -hmm. themselves. That that's that's a that's a gesture toward progress because our stories have always been universal. Just because they're rooted in our particularity doesn't mean they can't be universally resonant, right? right? Do you exactly. think this is a gesture toward that? I definitely think so. I mean, I was at South by Southwest. And at one point after the screening, I was surrounded by uh, 20 young people, not one of them black. They were um, Latina, Asian, white, mm -hmm. um, and I thought they were going to go talk to Terrell, you know, the you know the um, <laughs> Academy Award winner, and then they were okay. waiting to talk to me. So I, uh, you know, we just started talking. They were very blown away about the, about the series, about the show, um, and that um, they wanted to know how they can too basically show their authentic voice to also, you know, shine a light on it, which I thought that was amazing. It's something that we weren't even thinking about, you know, in telling this story. We all said in the writer's room that we wanted to tell this story, you know, by being unapologetically black, where you don't have to, you know, explain, you know, anything. They just are. Um, and they got that in a huge mm -hmm. way. And I, that was one of the first things, times I realized, okay, we got something else going on here. Um, in telling, you know, really Terrell's, you know, honesty in the way he approaches things and, and how, you know, I came in reflecting that was also my world. Other people, you know, have also um, glummed onto that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that, again, speaking of Toni Morrison, I'm sure you've seen this interview that went viral when the white one asked her, are you going to start writing about white characters? Right. <laughs> And you know Tony Morris didn't get no tea for the fever. <laughs> no, you know, she does she, not. She, oh, <laughs> mm, she cut her off. And she said, you have no idea how incredibly racist that statement is. I was like, damn, she's killing her right there. <laughs> killing her softly with her words. Right. And, and the point was, and, and she went on to say, you don't, a Russian writer, rushing in a, writing in Russian, in a Russian country, you would ask them when they're going to start writing about British people. Right. Or French people. Right. Exactly. So it is astonishing that the universality of our blackness uh -huh. ha has to be amplified and acknowledged. So talk to us about the relationship between kind of mother and son, because, you know, that could easily go south. Yes. You know, like, oh, my God, other, you know, either you're demonizing the black mother or it's not understanding the complicated situation that she has to negotiate. And it seems you both acknowledge responsibility, but also agency. Talk to us about that, that dance between them. Yes, for sure. I mean, the, it is a major dance between um, David and Gloria. Um, and you'll come to, in the coming episodes, um, really get to understand their relationship and her as a mother. It was very important for me to show a single mother and what they do and who they are as they go through the world. Because a lot of people think that suddenly because they see these young boys and girls are running around you know, here in, as they say, the, you know, the ghetto, and they don't see their, the parents. The parents are working their asses off. The, you know, that, that single mother is out there doing the work, checking on them, doing 50 billion things, catching a bus you know, hours away from where she lives. Mm -hmm. It was important to show that. Um, and I was a very big proponent in that, you know, Terrell was too. And the relationship between the two of them, there's a pact made between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like Gloria is a saint, you know, even from this episode, you understand um, that she's had problems. Um, there is also love, major love. She loves her kids. Um, and they both understand where they are and, you know, in trying to get to the next step. Um, and it's such you know, when I think about the rest of the nine hours, you know, every time I see, you know, this, I go, okay, I, I can't wait for them to see everything else because this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's like, you know, as far as music, dance, showing black excellence, being excellent. I mean, and just because you're poor doesn't mean that you don't have fun and you don't laugh. It's all of that. It's celebrating. It's, you know, it's a black celebration of, of this family um, within, you know, the, I mean, the, also the, the dope boys that you see they've created a family. So you kind of get to understand all of those elements and the school and what you think, you know, um, is a bad environment um, and a good environment that gets switched on you. Um, so we explore all of that. Right. No, and I think that's extremely important because, you know, not only between mother and son, but what, as you say, with the D-boys, with the dope boys mm -hmm. and to humanize them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know that at its best, hip hop has tried to bring a kind of complexity, mm -hmm. a kind of narrative of 
you know, construction to these lives to show that there's regret, there's remorse, yes. there's danger, mm -hmm. there's fear, mm -hmm. right? Having just uh, written this book on Jay, Jay Z, mm -hmm. and you know, revisiting those lyrics, but so many others have have done it as well. But to see it done here, I think is extremely important. Again, not to demonize, not to withhold moral judgment either, mm -hmm. but to show that there are some complex situations here, and people make choices based upon what's available to them. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And I think that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very visual. Yeah. I mean, it sounds ironic to say, of course, it's visual because <laughs> it's cinematic and it's theatrical. But <laughs> but the, the visual vocabulary, yeah. what I've defined out, you know, Moonlight before and then, of course, with this, the way it's shot, mm -hmm. the beauty, the radiant luminosity of that blackness. <laughs> yes. You know, just <laughs> I just love that, you know. <laughs> Just love that. Uh, it is a celebration of the blackness. Yes. It is, right? Because mm -hmm. when they talk about black women, black, you know, women magic, uh -huh. black, right? Black girl magic right. and black boy joy. And even when we see the way in which the, the grammar of visual and image, you know, visual representation speaks, mm -hmm. the image itself. Tell us why that's important uh, to communicate a story about the celebration of blackness and the excellence of blackness. Um, it was very important and showing, I mean, Miami is a very different type of place. And I actually had to go to Miami because, you know, Terrell kept talking about the blue. I kept asking him about the moonlight and the blue. I'm like, it's not really that blue. I mean, what light did you guys use? He goes, we didn't use the light. That's the sky. I'm like, right. is it? <laughs> right. So, and then I'm like, okay, well, let me go there. And he was right. It is the sky. It is the way the, the skin glistens. He wanted to show all of that. And it's raw, you know, because a lot of times, in the lighting of us, you know, it's it's not shown in its reality and its beauty. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to reflect that um, within the visual language. Also with the magical realism that, you know, David goes to, mm -hmm. um, color has a, has is another, color and music are different characters within um, as you kind of like go along. We change colors on you when you don't even realize we're changing colors on you. Mm -hmm. um, as you go from the Ville to the, you know, um, Galvin Middle School, um, it kind of like, there's subtle things that happen and that was all for a reason. Right. No, no, it's, it's beautiful. The shift is subtle. Yes. Sneak up on us, mm -hmm. change color. Have you shot all nine already? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. Gonna, all, all 10. Yes. All 10. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. <laughs> I was going to volunteer to go to Miami with you. To <laughs> scout Do the scene. Look at the sky. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm just here for you. Uh, so if you do some post-production, let me know. I will. Um, but speak about Miss Elijah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, uh, the beauty of, of, of black people's blackness, mm -hmm. right? The blackness of our blackness has right. been said, is that we got everything and everybody. <laughs> yes. And, you know, I don't know where the new, the new homophobia has come from, mm -hmm. right? The development. Maybe it's the evangelical piety that we've uncritically absorbed <laughs> and internalized <laughs> from white religionists who don't love us whether we're gay or straight, right. but that's another story. Right. Um, but but it, it, it does seem to me that the beauty of complex and complicated blackness is that we have not tolerance. We have the, a prolific engagement with every kind of black personality there is and every kind of lifestyle and every kind of choice and every kind of gender, genre, and, and orientation. So speak about you know, Miss Elijah and why it's important in a non-stereotypical fashion, though a fabulous one, mm -hmm. to, to, <laughs> right, to, to have that presence. Right? Um, mainly because can any, I mean, there's always a Miss Elijah in those communities. No matter what people, you know, try to pretend like there aren't. I'm right. like, how many people here had a Miss Elijah in their community that mm -hmm. you can remember? You know, exactly. It's like it was like for me in New Orleans it was like um Miss Johnny. So and they mm. were are they see everything, they're like part of the fabric of the community. And Terrell felt it important to have that, you know, character within there. Um that is someone, I mean, when I think about the, just the relationship, I mean, uh that you're gonna like understand a lot more mm. um about Miss Elijah, um, the relationship between her and Glor um him, her, and uh, with Gloria, the mm -hmm. mom, um, why there's a closeness, why there's connection. Right. Um, it is beautiful, but it's also how um, that person has learned to survive, you right. know, um, uh, going forward and, and, and how they look 
after the community, you know, they have eyes on everybody when you, you don't even realize they don't have, have eyes on you. Um, so it was very yeah, important was to show clear, that right? part of it, you mm-hmm. know, where it's not being stereotypical um, yeah. of the community as they always try to say the black community is very homophobic. It, that has just been the fabric of the community, period. Um, so it's important to show that. Yeah, no, that, that that is important. Yeah, and Travis does such a great, great, I mean, it's interesting with Travis. Uh, he was the first person to interview, to come in to audition for uh, Miss Elijah. And and we had a very different, I think all of us had a different idea of what we want Miss Elijah to be. And after Travis left, I think we, me, Terrell, and the um, cast director, Carmen Cuba, uh, we all just said, well, I think that, that was Miss Elijah. Hey. And we saw like, you know, other people came in and we like kept going and we just kept going, okay, bring in Travis, you know, yeah. so from and the beginning and, and he will even say that character ended up changing him to help him live his best, his real true self. Right. So, which is really live amazing. His, Usually it happens the other way around and Oprah right. has talked about that as well. Right. Live his best life mm-hmm. and going back and forth. With no. You. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no extra editorial comments. Um, so, you know, one of the things, you know, anthropologists talk about weighthood for, you know, in places like Africa, part of the Middle East, mm-hmm. where the progress of young people is delayed into adulthood because of lack of opportunity. Mm-hmm. The, the irony is then, you know, black kids get that part and then they get rushed into adulthood. All these studies that come out to say black kids who are eight and nine are looked at like they're 16 and 17 and 18, right? right? Mm-hmm. Um, so they're grown black men, right. <laughs> they treat like kids, right? even when they're in the White House. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then, I'm just saying. Uh, and then young people, mm-hmm. they saddle with the responsibilities of adulthood, right? Mm-hmm. But you deal with the responsibilities, the agonies of young people in low income black mm-hmm. neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Why is it important to preserve and present their humanity in the midst of that when we've had people just rank on them, dog them, jam them up? This this one loves them, embraces mm-hmm. them and understands the, the, the difficulties of the situations they confront. Yes. And it's exactly that because no one else is doing it and it needs to be done and it needs to be shown. Um, all of us were the David and you'll meet, you know, Tare, you'll meet Marissa, um, Nate, living their lives um, and still thriving. You know, it's not like they stop thriving. So it's like important for us to show that, you know, they, they're in dance, they're in music. His magical, David's magical realism will take over where we're going to take you in so, so many different places that normal t- television doesn't take you into, which is so exciting. I remember one there's a few scenes I'm like, oh my God, if we pull this off, if we pull this off, this is going to be so great. And I think we did a hell of a job and I cannot wait for you guys to see a lot of the things. And I can't say what they are because it'll like <laughs> tell things, but it, it celebrates um, what is great about, you know, us, but still again, have a universality to it mm-hmm. um, where you have, everyone has their dreams and it is showing that, that mm-hmm. these young black um, um these young black uh, women and men have, I mean, young boys and girls have dreams right. um, that they're trying to, you know, be a dancer. They're trying to like, you know, um, be a writer. Um, it's not just about, okay, let me go out here and sell some drugs, you know, because I really want to do that. <laughs> well, right. Right. You know? <laughs> There's a raison d'etre for that. Right. I don't know about y'all, but when I first, what is it? Sky, what's the uh, character's name? The mentor? Sky. Yeah, Sky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought that was Tommy from Martin. <laughs> Martin. Okay, I'm just. <laughs> I was like, Tommy. <laughs> Tommy came back. <laughs> I mean, I was like, man, they brought my man back. Uh, but speak about that magical realism, right? Uh-huh. Because often it seems to me that um, that the the invocation of that magical realism, again, again, think about Toni Morrison or Garcia Marquez, for uh-huh. that matter. Uh, novelistically, what it has afforded us to do is to imagine a different universe of possibility. Yes. So that now, you know, it opens up, it seems to me, a different moral avenue, a different intellectual avenue, and a different avenue for this young man to have a relationship with a fictive, you know, or spiritual 
uh, or imagined companion mm -hmm. that gives him some guidance that's that's not available in quote his real life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Terrell is a very visual writer and the director Michael Williams really gave us a visual language um, to, to kind of make that pop. Mm -hmm. And we kind of like ran with it because it was important to show what is going on in this young man's mind, not to see this young boy from the outside as the world is seeing him, but what he's seeing from the inside, what he's taking from the various individuals um, that come into his life and how he, you know, kind of computes that in, in his head. Mm -hmm. I was a huge daydreamer growing up. Um, and when I started writing, this teacher, Ms. Brown, when she started getting me to write, slowly my daydreams went away. And that's when I realized what I was meant to do. Mm -hmm. And so Terrell talks about that, about, you know, his writing was also very, he was a big um, uh, daydreamer. Um, he, he would have like things play out in front of him. And I said, like, I did that all the time. So we connected in that way. Right. And it was important to show how he, uh, David is able to deal with all these things that are happening to him um, through his daydreams. And then you also find out, you know, that it's not, you know, all him, it's not all stolen when we get into um, an episode that, that focuses on his mom. Right. You know, um, where you think that she's one thing and you realize there's a lot of things, you know. That's right. You, yeah. So it's, that was really important for us to like show and and to do it in a, such a grounded way, because you think of special effects like um, on different shows like Star Trek. We don't get to see that, you know, mm -hmm. in this type of show where they would deem, I guess, urban. Um, we're telling a coming of age story in a very different way from this, you know, young boys POV. Mm -hmm. You know, and showing it through colors and, and music and dance. And um, it's really exciting to get it, you know, to get it out there. As, you know, Oprah said, I was saying, you know, we're, we're doing art for television. And then Oprah said, we're doing, we're, I mean, she has said we poetry. It's like we're, we have poetry um, for television. So. Oh, that's, yeah, that's mm -hmm. beautiful. It's nice when black nerdiness meets, meets <laughs> you know, black nerdiness. You know, exactly. indifference, eccentricity, uh -huh. weirdness, yes. daydreaming. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you said I stopped start writing and the daydream disappeared. That's that's exactly. that's poetry. See? You spitting bars there you go. over there. You there spitting you bars go. over there. <laughs> daydreaming and I'm thinking of you. Uh, look, it's hard up here. Um, <laughs> and not only all of that, right? That visual poetry, but I, you know, the the Robert Hayden. I'm a sucker. You had me at Robert <laughs> Hayden. Right. Runagate, Runagate, mm -hmm. Middle Passage. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about that. The you know, it, it was um, to paraphrase um, Frederick Douglass, where he said literacy unfits a child for slavery. Mm. Right. Because you can't be literate and willfully subject to someone else. Right. To own you because you own yourself. Exactly. And to see that, you know, the exchange mm -hmm. of poet poetic verse. Yes. Uh, there is is not normal, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, right? It, it doesn't, I mean, not normal in terms of, in terms of the representation mm -hmm. for us, you know, so talk a bit about that. I mean, I think that's, that was rather striking to me. Well, and that goes back to Dr. Woodstrap and mm -hmm. showing that, also showing the colors, different colors of uh, sky mm -hmm. that, you know, whereas you would see him in one way on the street as being a drug dealer, right? you know, but obviously he was also taught mm -hmm. by Dr. Woodstrap. And like he said, he could have gone the way that he is pushing David to go, you know, but when you get caught up, it only takes one time. Right. Um, and he did not get back up before it was too late. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it was, it was being able to kind of like show um, in, you know, the various communities, all the different storytelling, because we are storytellers, right. you know, um, and those stories get passed on. Uh, the you know um, reading you know Robert Hayden, mm -hmm. um, it uh, was important for us to have that language within there. That is not the normal you know stereotypes of who these these young men and women are. Are we gonna get more backdrop and background for Sky and what happened and so on? Oh yes. Can you give us a little? Okay. Mm. Yeah. I can. I mean, we're gonna be showing like a little bit like, like a previous. I mean, what you um was showing now you're gonna get to you know hear, you know. Get a little taste, and you'll see all the different elements. Okay. But when yes. were we going to see that? When were we going to? Well, it? after we're done. After we're done? Yes. Oh, they're going to see it right here tonight? Yeah, it'll be right here. Oh, right here? Mm -hmm. While we're on stage? Yes. Talking? Uh -huh. So we should go to it now? Yeah, we can oh, do it now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hit it.
I'm just getting sound effects. Yes. <laughs> you were good because I thought that was coming out. <laughs> hire me, hire me. I <laughs> so it's a lot more to that. Yes. And we're going to get the story of mm -hmm. Sky, of Sky. I, yes. I died, mm -hmm. came back, mm -hmm. did his thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we think about, you know, does it ever strike you um, in doing the, the kind of magnificent work you're doing that why is it so hard? Uh, for us to be able to tell a variety of stories and to have those stories supported. We don't lack stories. Mm -hmm. You know, when they say, you know, tell vicious lies about black people. I mean, every black person, look, when I'm on the street, hey man, I got a book. I want to give you this book. <laughs> I, I wrote this book last night. Uh, <laughs> can you read it? I like, right now? I mean, oh, I, I, later, I mean, dang. Uh -huh. I mean, black people lack no ambition, no, no literary desire to represent mm -mm. and to tell stories. Why is it so difficult for the nuanced, complicated notions of black stories to, to find support? I think we're just starting to get into it more. I think right now, finally, you know, with, like you said earlier, Black Panther, you know, mm -hmm. all of these movies that are showing that, yes, there are, you know, international audiences, you know, waiting to hear our stories. So it's, it's great. I think it's a great time right now mm -hmm. to keep pushing. And there's a lot of pushing for so many different type of stories. Um, as far as why they weren't being done before, it was because the people who were making the decisions weren't us. Mm -hmm. Now we have more people making those decisions. We have people more pushing those decisions. We are like now proving, you know, them, you know, them wrong, a lot more showrunners. So now they have no other choice but to now because we're not going nowhere else. So mm. all the stories are about to get told now. Mm. So yes. all the stories about to get told. <laughs> yeah. That's a great title for a piece. All the stories about to get told. <laughs> right, right now. Now, um, do, do y'all looking for um, almost senior citizen black, <laughs> black intellectuals who are looking for another career? I mean, could I audition for you right quick? You know, the Godfather, yeah. writer, director, producer. Look how they massacred my boy. <laughs> I mean, that's from the. The scene with the, with the Undertaker. Come on, it's Marlon Brando. Forty two years. I don't have cotton in my jaw. You think I got a future? I think you got a future. Oh, I love you. Yes. All right, let's give it up. <laughs> <laughs> For Miss D and David makes man. All Next right? Wednesday, August fourteenth, ten o'clock after Queen Sugar. Whoa! Go ahead on the own network. Yes. Oprah Winfrey. All right. Thank y'all so much for your patience. Y'all been out here been beautiful. See y'all tomorrow.